Hello. Welcome to Postcolonial Space. I'm Masood Raja. And in this video, I will continue my conversation of Edward Said's Orientalism. Now, we have already covered the introduction, page by page, line by line, and you can watch it over here. Today, in today's brief video, I will cover from page 30 to 40 of chapter 1, which is entitled, The Scope of Orientalism. Now, before I delve into it, I want to make just one clarification. I have decided not to read the book on screen because I think that will take a lot of time to finish the book. But what I will do is I will go page by page in a chronological order and try to explain things as, as they appear to me. Now, as always, it goes without saying that no amount of video lectures can ever clarify all ideas about any text, but especially a text as complex and as magisterial as Orientalism. So I highly recommend that as we discuss these chapters and as you watch these videos, you should also read the book along with these lectures, and maybe then you'll be able to benefit more from this entire exercise. So here we go. We'll start at page 30. And the first thing that appears is the quotation at the beginning of the chapter, right? And uh, a lot of people just gloss over it. And that's from uh, Jean Baptiste Fourier, right? But what's also more important is as to where it was published, right? So it was published in a publication that published from 1809 till 1829, and it was called a Description de Egypt or Description of Egypt. Now, this publication is crucial because in this publication, the works of about 160 scholars from different branches of knowledge were collected and published. Okay. And these were the scholars who accompanied Napoleon Bonaparte in his invasion of Egypt. That's the crucial point. And so hence this publication is yet another example of Europeans being there in Egypt but having the power to record it, right? So let's bear that in mind. I've mentioned it previously in the introduction, too. And, of course, Said talks about it in the book as well as later in his interviews. That, that, that is one of the most significant aspects of Orientalism. You have to have power to be there and then the power to record it and then disseminate it. There is nothing random about it. So the quote... Uh, kind of translates. I have a rough Google translation of it, and you can do a better lit literal translation of it. Reads, and I'll put it on the screen. The French text is up there, as well as the English. The anxious and ambitious genius of Europeans, impatient to use the new instruments of their power. Now, let's keep this in mind as we discuss the opening of chapter one, because that is the issue that he stages for us with the speeches in the British Parliament, or the speech in the British Parliament of Balfour, right? Arguing for a certain kind of of relationship and treatment of Egypt. And what emerges in that speech, we'll discuss it in a minute, is what Said is mentioning as this European way of looking at Egypt, but also at other Oriental civilizations, countries, and spaces. So the chapter one, first section is called Knowing the Orient. Okay, And there is a reason that Said starts with a particular speech by Arthur James Balfour. Now, the full text of this debate is available online, and I'll post a link in the description. Balfour is responding to an objection raised by a member of parliament, right? And we read about him later 
uh, in this chapter on the actually f on the very first page and that's a challenge by a member of par par parliament from tiny side and and his question is what right have you to take up these airs of superiority with regard to people whom you choose to call oriental that's the question being asked and within the debate then balfour is answering that question and it is in that answer that said points to out to us the kind of belief system the kind of tropes the kind of ideas that existed in the minds of most europeans but especially someone like balfour who had been the prime minister who had been the foreign secretary who claimed a certain degree of knowledge on the orient on egypt so in a way he balfour is this ideal enunciating subject right as hugo would call it within the discourse of orientalism and by starting the discussion of the book with this particular speech about an oriental subject that is the future of egypt which had been taken over by the british in 1882 and was a british colony and where nationalism was rising so by using balfour's speech what uh, Said is doing is is then giving us the mode of thinking and speaking about Egypt and hence the Orient by a British subject who kind of inhabits that identity of a powerful Orientalist, right? That's why he is starting with him. Now, the opening lines and even before that there is a reference to uh, bacon right the baconian way of looking at power and if you look it up i mean the term knowledge is power scientia potestas est is usually associated with bacon even though it doesn't really appear in any of his published works so when said calls Balfour's explanation, Baconian, that's what he means, right? Now, keep in mind, uh, in the process of discussing this book, what I'm trying to uh, pass on to you is, is different modes of reading these texts. And one of the most important way of doing that is to go and find the original materials that are referred to. So, for example, when I wanted to know you know, the full speech of Arthur James Balfour, I went and looked it up. And thankfully, the British archive is available online. So that gives us the ability to read his speech, but read it within the context of the debate, because there were opposing point of views. Right one mentioned here by the Member of Parliament, J.M. Robertson. But the crucial here for us to understand is what Said is doing is he is using Balfour's speech to highlight a certain way of looking at Egypt and Orient and that that way of looking is imbued with what he calls the discourse of Orientalism. So I'm going to read a little and then we can talk about it. But that's, you know, the general way we will approach the book, but that's the specific way Said opens the book with a discussion of Egypt by Arthur James Balfour, who could very well be considered an authority on Egypt in the U European sense of the, of the word, and who has internalized certain views of Egypt that could only have been produced through the discourse of Orientalism. And I think that is the point of the book first chapter starting with that okay so before i go into discussing the specific citations from belfort's speech there are a few other things scattered in the very first paragraph that we need to unpack now um, said is establishing belfort's credentials in two terms right in of course his understanding his service to the british government 
as the prime minister, as the foreign secretary, but also someone who is aware of some major events that have preceded this 1910 debate. And Said mentions some of the things. Some of the things are easily accessible, you know, the Afghan war or the Zulu wars, right? The British occupation of Egypt, there's a lot of material in it, right? But then he mentions the death of General Gordon in Sudan, the Fashoda incident, the Battle of Omdurman, the Boer War, right? So what was the death of General Gordon, right? So we need to look it up because that kind of gives us additional knowledge, right? So the Charles George Gordon was a British general who had fought in China, but then he was also sent into Sudan, right? And he is the one who had to fight against the Mahdi of Sudan, right? In the, when the city that he was in was besieged by the warriors of Mahdi of Sudan. And now that tells us, let's learn something about Mahdi of Sudan. So Mahdi of Sudan was Muhammad Ahmed bin Abdullah, right? Born in 1844 and died in 1885. He was the one who claimed to be the Mahdi and his disciples and everyone else, right, declared themselves Ansar. And they were the ones who held off the British in Sudan, right? So General Gordon dies in that war, in that battle against the Mahdi's armies, right? So Balfour knows about that. The incident in Fashuda happened, you know, in uh, the 1898 when the French advanced northwards to the upper Nile and both the French and the British armies faced each other and it was uh, feared that they would go to war but then French withdrew their claims and that's how the British consolidated their power there. And so we need to look that up, right? And, and, uh, and then the Battle of Omdurman is when General Kitchener, also a battle in which the superiority of arms, not the numbers, decides the fate of the battle. And, and so that's the major battle where the finally the armies of the Mahdi of Sudan are defeated and British establish their control, right? So these are some of the references you know, just interspersed on the first page of the book. And all that Said is telling us that not only has Balfour been part of the British government, including to, be, to have been the prime minister, he was actually very powerful until the end of his life in the conservative party politics, right? He was a senior leader of it. But also that he is privy to all these major instances of British rule everywhere in the world. This is the subject that he picks up. And it is this subject who is speaking in the British Parliament, right, for the British to still remain engaged in Egypt, right? So when we get to his speech, what we are dealing, de sorry, what we are dealing with is not necessarily a naive British politician. We are dealing with a veteran politician who would qualify in all respects to inhabit the identity of a powerful Orientalist, right? And he has that worldview. So let's read one of the passages that Said cites from his speech, right? I take up no attitude of superiority. But I ask of Robertson and anyone else, the people who are objecting to it, who has even the most superficial knowledge of history if they will look in the face the facts with which a British statesman has to deal when he is put in position of supremacy over great races like the inhabitants of Egypt and countries in the East. We know the civilization of Egypt better than we know the civilization of any other country. We know it further back. We know it more intimately. We know more about it. It goes far beyond the petty span of history of our race, which is lost in the prehistoric period at a time when the Egyptian civilization had already passed its prime. Look at all the Oriental countries. Do not talk about superiority or inferiority. So that's a loaded passage, and Said is going to unpack it. 
But what he's saying is, I'm not talking in terms of we are superior to them. No, we know. We have read it. We have researched it. We know Egypt. We know that it has a long, illustrious history, right? And we know all the other countries in that region too. So what he's emphasizing is that, look, first of all, he starts his speech also by saying, this is not like dealing with our own shires here. This is Egypt. But why we are invested in Emmet? Because we know our Egypt. We have researched it. We know its history, right? Knowledge. We have the knowledge about Egypt. And that's what Said is talking about. And Said writes, two great themes dominate his remarks here and in what will follow, knowledge and power. The Baconian themes, okay? We've already talked about Bacon. As Balfour justifies the necessity for British occupation of Egypt, supremacy in his mind is associated with our knowledge of Egypt and not principally with military or economic power. Knowledge to Balfour means surveying a civilization from its origins to its prime to its decline. And of course, it means being able to do that. And so that is a crucial point to keep in mind as you read Orientalism. You can't just sit and write a novel, you know, sitting somewhere and be an Orientalist, right? It must be backed with the power to represent, right? So the claim that Balfour is laying to British presence and investment in Egypt as the overlord of Egypt is based in knowledge. We know Egypt, right? And that knowledge, that supremacy over Egypt is based in this knowledge, right? It's not natural, but it is. We know it, and we are there. Two things, right? We have the power to maintain our hold on this territory, and we have the knowledge to do that, right? That is what Said is pointing to, this, this mindset, this idea of knowledge, not military power, but knowledge and how it is mobilized to control a people, and then having the power to be there, to mandate your policies, right? So we'll go on. But these are uh, two themes that Said says are emerging is knowledge and power. So now keep in mind, you can't read this without reading Foucault. Knowledge and power are Foucauldian terms. As I discussed in our discussion of the introduction, Said clearly tells us that he is relying on Foucault's discussion and theory of discourse to write this book. This was actually, as I've always said, the first major academic book in the United States that actually uses Foucault's theory of discourse. So keep that in mind. And so I'll go on and we'll talk about, uh, more about it. I probably had promised to read 10 pages. Let's see how long this goes and then maybe I might truncate it and do only five pages. But let's see how it goes. So in the middle of page 33, after the first citation from Balfour, Said briefly talks about it, about this knowledge. And what he says is, and I quote, the object of such knowledge is inherently vulnerable to scrutiny. This object is a fact, which if it develops, changes, or otherwise transforms itself in the way that civilizations frequently do, nevertheless, is fundamentally, even ontologically stable. So what Balfour knows and what the Orientalists know about Egypt, that is treated as stable knowledge, right? And then to have such knowledge of such a thing is to dominate it, to have authority over it. And authority here means for us, that is the British, to deny autonomy to it, the Egypt. 
So because the British know their Egypt, right? Balfour is saying it's not a question of superiority or inferiority. We know our Egypt and we are there. And hence, we have a responsibility to control it, right? So in a way then, in the minds of these imperialists and orientalists, being there, is, it becomes kind of a responsibility, a duty, right? And then Said also says that throughout his speech, Balfour doesn't really deny British superiority. He takes it for granted. It is kind of the silences of the text, the things that you take for granted. And he describes then the consequences of this knowing, this knowledge. And that's where the next quote from Balfour comes in. And Said gives us the full quote. And here is what he says. It's a very long quote. I'm not probably going to read it all. But here it is. This is Balfour. First of all, look at the facts of the case. Vet Western nations, as soon as they emerged into history, show the beginnings of those capacities for self-governance. Okay, so uh, I'm not going to read the whole quote, but here is the sum of it, right? What he's arguing is that the, the Orientals and the Westerns are inherently different. The way the Western societies develop, they develop into aut autonomous beings, they develop self-governing systems, and hence the democracies, whereas the Orientals, they always are despotic, they have not developed self-governance, and all of all of this assumes, first of all, that the Western model is better, that's taken for granted. But then he also argues in this quote that the natives want us, the British, to introduce our enlightened system there, right? And to which Said argues that Balfour produces no evidence that Egyptians and the races with him we deal, it's a quote, appreciate or even understand the good that is being done them by colonial occupation. It does not occur to Balfour, however, to let the Egyptians speak for himself, since presumably any Egyptian who could speak out is more likely be the agitator who wishes to raise difficulties than the good native who overlooks the difficulties of foreign domination. So here is the dilemma for the Egyptians. I mean, they can't speak for themselves, right? And if they speak, they are the agitators, they are the terrorists, right? They are the ones who disagree with what British think is their responsibility to do, that is to civilize and control Egypt. So throughout this speech then, what is coming across through Balfour's speech is this idea almost naturalized that since the British know the Egypt better than the Egyptians know it and better than anyone else know it, and since the British are there through force, it is their responsibility to maintain that control. And throughout this debate, the Egyptians cannot speak for themselves, right? So this idea that the Orient is stable and ossified and is in the past doesn't have a trajectory of self-governance that the Egyptians that, that the Europeans did. Hence, the knowledge and power makes it possible for Balfour and so many others like him to argue that British should control their Egypt, right? And this was the argument given for India as well, okay, in the British Parliament, that um, how, how would they handle everything after we leave? And we know that story really well. And then there are certain other quotes, like he also argues that England exports are very best to these countries. These selfless administrators do their work amidst tens of thousands of per persons belonging to a different creed, a different race, a different discipline. This is still part of the quote. So then this is also, and if you have read The White Man's Burden, right, you... Uh, you already know that this is offered as a native mission. So not only do we know our Egypt, but we send our best to serve selflessly the interest of these heathens, right? That's what comes across in Kipling's 
uh, white man's burden, right? A poem that comes out around the same time, or maybe at the turn of the century and not in 1910 when this speech is being made. So what makes their work of governing possible is their sense of being supported at home by a government that en endorses what they do, and that is what Balfour is arguing. Give us the money to fund the enterprise in Egypt, okay? Because what we do is noble, and we have to do it because we are there. We know our Egypt, right? And so we are right now on page 34, and I think I'm going to just read one more quote and end this lecture here because it's getting very long, and then we will start from the bottom of page 34 in the next part of chapter 1. But let me read another quote, and it says, directly the native population Yet, directly, the native populations have the instinctive feeling that those with whom they have got to deal have not behind them the might, the authority, the sympathy, the full and ungrudging support of the country which sent them there. Those populations lose all the sense of order, which is the very basis of their civilization, just as our officers lose all that sense of power and authority, which is the very basis of everything they can do for the benefit of those among whom they have been sent. So here is the f are the facts. The relationship between the colonial administratives and natives are of power. That power is underwritten by knowledge, but also by the might of the empire that sent them. Right. Another hint here is that the natives will only respond to the colonial officials' dictates if they know that the might of the empire stands behind them. And the workers, people who work there as the colonial administrators, would also only be effective if they have that sense of power, right? So if the empire doesn't support their venture, Obviously, the natives will take over. That's the fear. But what comes out of this is that Egypt can be only be maintained through force, controlled through knowledge, and the natives only respect power, right? And that the empire must invest in this project, right? So the certain view of natives that comes is that they can be subjugated and controlled through power, and they are obsequious to this imperial power behind the of the, the colonial officers, that comes across pretty clearly. Let's see how Said argues about it, right? And Said says, Balfour's logic here is interesting, not, le not least for being completely consistent with the premises of his entire speech. England knows Egypt. Egypt is what England knows. England knows that Egypt cannot have self-government. England confirms that by occupying Egypt, Okay. England, that they can't have self-government, England confirms that by occupying Egypt. For the Egyptians, Egypt is what England has occupied and now governs. Foreign uh, occupation, therefore, becomes the very basis of contemporary Egyptian civilization. Egypt requires, indeed, insists upon British occupation. But if the special intimacy between governor and governed in Egypt is disturbed by parliament's doubts at home, then the authority of what is the dominant race, and as I think ought to remain the dominant race, has been undermined. Not only does English prestige suffer, and there are some quotes here from Balfour, it is vain for a handful of British officials. Endow them how you like. Give them all the qualities of character and genius you can imagine. It is impossible for them to carry out the great task which in Egypt, not we only, but the civilized world has imposed upon them. So the argument here, and we are still on page 34, and I'm going to end here. What Balfour is then arguing as we followed his argument in this speech Remember, he's asking for funding, right? Is that we know our Egypt. So the Egypt that he's talking about is the Egypt not of the Egyptians, but the Egypt that the British know. We are there because, you know, we control it. The natives have no history of self-governance and will not be able to self-govern. They can't think for themselves. So that's the natives fixed in place. Our only hope 
to keep the situation under control, and we must because that's our civilizational mission, is through the best that we have sent there, right? Our civil servants. They will only be effective if the might of empire is behind them. So the logic of the argument then is that Egypt cannot be by itself. We must control it because that's the only way it can exist, right? The native will only respect us there if we send our best and then back them up with the might of the empire. It's kind of a circular logic. We are there, so we must stay there. We are there to help these people who cannot help themselves, right? In order to do that, we must convince these people that we have the absolute power of the empire behind the officials who are governing them. And then we must constantly support it because the future of England, future of Egypt, and future of the civilization depends on it. So what comes across in these first paragraphs through a reading of this speech by Saeed is an imperial argument which is deeply imbued by the discourse of Orientalism. So Saeed, after having told us what he means by Orientalism in introduction, is now teaching us here is an example political example from a debate in parliament about a colonized territory called Egypt, in this speech then you see the orientalist mindset of viewing Egypt, right, by a British official. Now, on an aside, why is it crucial to know this? Since I'm stopping on page 34, I mean, think of it. We were here when Iraq was invaded, right? The second Iraq war during Bush's time. What was the argument being made there when the Iraqis insisted we must have our own government, that they are not ready for it? I mean, here are a people who have been a nation who have the wealthiest resources of the world in terms of oil, who had a system of government. Okay, it was tyrannical or whatever, also put in place by America. But the argument against self-governance of Iraqis was the same argument. They are not ready for democracy, right? They, they, we can't leave, right? There was, and, and it's our responsibility now to, to see them through. That was F. Paul Bremer's mission there, right? So the same arguments are still used same orientalist arguments about the same regions of the world. And that is what Said is teaching us here. So I'm going to stop here on page 34, right? Uh, please disregard my earlier declaration in the beginning of this um, video that I'll do 10 pages. I've only done four pages. And then I'll come back and maybe we'll continue our discussion of chapter one. That's all I have today. Thank you so much. And uh, let me know if you have any questions or if you have any suggestions. And I will try to incorporate them in the next lectures and next conversations. Until then, please take care of yourself. Thank you so much. And as always, peace and love.